There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All to Innerverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I am grateful and honored that you're tuning in to another episode. When I imagine the average listener to this show, I often picture a youthful and young at heart guy or gal, not unlike myself, with a deep interest in all branches of philosophy that leads them to investigate their reality from every angle with the data analyzing and pattern recognizing part of the brain always switched on and crunching on the tasty morsels of truth that appear in every moment of our conscious perception, just waiting to be discovered. The person I'm imagining probably loves nature and getting outdoors, and even in the most serene moments of stress-free bliss, they're probably still feeling the itch to jump into a deeper philosophical conversation about the framework of the universe. Well, my friends, we're in good company today, as our guest for this episode is one of us, a deep mind who's always got his eye on the truth prize, a real fly on the wall of the Universal Akashic Library, but you might know him as the Philosophy Guy. His name is Brendan Weber, and he's a dude from rural Iowa who jumped off the stereotypical farm kid train as it was passing through the spooky quantum forest and has been exploring the unknown ever since. He's a fellow podcast host who flies solo and delivers his thoughts on a wide variety of philosophical ideas and examines how they crop up in culture, art, and media. His podcast is called The Philosophy Guy, and you can find it on all your favorite podcast catching services, where for over 60 episodes, he's been embodying his name and expressing his love for wisdom. And he's definitely a cool cat who's cut from the same cloth as many of us in the Interverse tribe. On his show, you can catch him discussing everything from Rick and Morty to Krishnamurti. And with many episodes around the 15 to 30 minute mark, the content is deliciously bite-sized and ready for you to digest. You can also support Brandon Weber on Patreon and get a variety of bonus content and perks, just like you can with Interverse. Since I do make sure not to load this show up with ads just to get some easy cash, I'd definitely appreciate it if you'd check out patreon.com forward slash Interverse, where you can become a plus member and unlock the extended version of all my episodes, including this one, and enjoy doubling your fun with an awesome archive of over 80 shows that generally hit the two hour mark and more. Make sure to check the show notes if you want to find links to sign up, more information on things we're going to discuss today, and subscribe to The Philosophy Guy on your favorite podcast player. Now it's time to don those thinking caps and get ready for that deep and engaging conversation that you've been craving with the philosophical filibuster and wizard of the world's wisdom traditions, Brendan Weber. Thanks so much for being here, dude, and welcome to Interverse. Glad to be here, and I enjoyed that little, I like the creative intro you have. It's one of my few areas where I can be creative with this <laughs> other than just talking. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, but uh, tell us who you are, man. I'm I'm just getting to know you myself, and I'm pretty excited to be making this connection. I think we may be off to an awesome conversation right here. Yeah, back at you. Yeah, uh, I guess a little bit about me. I got into philosophy in college. I got into political philosophy. And yeah, I kind of just started exploring those and going through different avenues with that. and. A uh, conversation I got fascinated with after kind of the political philosophy stuff was these ideas around consciousness. And with that, you know, I kind of went down the materialist path of, you know, basically everything being physical in the sense that that's where everything is derived from, including our consciousness. And with that conversation, I basically was like, kind of set aside the consciousness conversation because I was like, oh, at some point, our material conversation, our material, material progress and science and all that, we're going we're gonna to figure it out. So I kind of set aside the consciousness conversation because I was like, well, there's nothing for me to really do or to explore as kind of this philosophy person that's interested in philosophy. And actually like this past, I don't know, even like I'd say a couple of years or so, I kind of got reintroduced to the conversation through various experiences of my own and kind of just exploring some various ideas in philosophy and then some like new kind of discoveries in science. 
And kind of the way I've started putting it is I see this new kind of uniting almost like force forming where there's like these, these ideas that we can get into in philosophy that becoming popular again. And I'm kind of referring to panpsychism um, and we can talk about idealism as well. But then also in science, there's like a couple of scientists coming out and be like, Hey, you know, basically all of our perceptions, we can't really trust. We're, we're dealing with this interface that we see the world through and we can't really trust that thing. And it's really hard for us to trust what we discover in science. And to me, that's, it's like kind of like shifting the dots and kind of uniting the dots in that sense. And then of course you have kind of the more mystical psychedelic world, higher states of consciousness, whether it's through meditation, psychedelics, whatever it is to reach those higher states, you know, all of a sudden I see all these similarities starting to form around each other and these little dots and, and kind of the part of the ways I put it is it's like, we're all kind of trying to figure out at least in some sense, like this, this puzzle of what the hell is going on. Right. And I feel like all of us are kind of Sometimes we're not communicating enough because we're all trying to figure out the same puzzle, but it's like we can start connecting the dots of that puzzle in a meaningful way. if We start communicating a little better. And that's why I've kind of wanted to start exploring this is trying to like kind of unite these three areas that I'm really, really interested in, but like they never seem to communicate. So that's kind of one of the things I wanted to bring up and talk about and kind of where I've gotten fascinated with more of this stuff around consciousness. Beautiful, man. I'm sure you're not the only one that got a heavy dose of the materialist philosophy in school mm-hmm. and from you know the culture at large. Like it's not cool to be anything but an atheist type of right thing that was happening for quite a while there. Although I think the tides turned a little bit on that and people yeah. were getting a lot more open minded, whether they were trapped in a religious dogma or well, I mean, I think a lot of atheist thought is almost a religious dogma in itself, but <laughs> that's another topic we might get into. I know you've talked about that on your show, but yeah. the puzzle metaphor you brought up is a good one because I've always liked to say, I don't know who I heard say this first, but the world is like a, the mystery of reality is like a 10 trillion piece puzzle. And each of us only have a handful of pieces or maybe none. And mm-hmm. we're trying to put it together in a giant room with no lights. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, yeah, that's a great analogy to put that. And that's exactly right. And which is why the whole like communication thing, I feel like is really important because it's like, hey, we're all in this dark room. Don't really know what's going on. So maybe the best we can do is like talk to each other because we can't really see what's going on, you know? <laughs> right. It's only it's actually only through and this is a big component of uh, certain idealists, like the German idealists, a big component of their thought was that. It's only through the interfacing with the other that you can even know yourself to begin with. You would, that's maybe why this entire construct came about as we experience it now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But back to the materialism thing, I think that we've definitely reached the point where trying to look at all the elementary particles and break those down into smaller particles and this search for the uh, p- promised canvas that reality is painted on, you know, the the Mm -hmm. underlying substructure, if you will, which in philosophy is called like the ground of philosophy in a sense. And the, they keep looking, they keep looking and there's actually no canvas. (laughs) The closer they get to the canvas, the more it vanishes and becomes pure subjectivity. So I think that, uh, you know, I'm really curious about what personal experiences might've led you to start looking at consciousness in the non-materialistic way. And also, you know, after that, maybe we can talk about some of the philosophers that you got into that had some different ideas. Yeah. I mean, one of the experiences, whether you want to call it through, you know, consciousness and through various forms of meditation, I guess we'll just kind of leave it vague in that sense. And, And it's, it's like this, this, realization of whether you want to call it, you know, the oneness, higher consciousness, and almost like, I don't know how to put this, but like, I've heard someone say, like, you're, you're in another dimension level, right? Kind of not to get too like, woo woo for for everyone. But you're like in another state of consciousness where your reason is going out the door, your ego is going out the door, right? And you're kind of just in this space of feeling. And feeling of energy, whatever you want to call it, right? So then that that feeling fades away. You kind of get back into your kind of ego body, right? And then once you're back in the ego body, you put you start trying to reason through 
what you experience through this meditative state, I'll call it. And once I realized that, it kind of made me realize some of the the assumptions I was making about kind of the, the materialist assumptions about the world, about consciousness, and what the hell that means. And this is where we can, I feel like we can almost transition right now. We can also always get back to those different states if we want. But it was like, okay, the materialist basically says about consciousness is, okay, we're going we're gonna to continue our, our science and experiments and hypothesis and create theories. And then at some point, we're going to develop, understand the physical mind enough, and all of a sudden consciousness will form. And it's almost like they, they think it's like a switch will turn on. When I, when I heard that after I like had these realizations, I was like, that's, that's a big assumption to make. After I've already had this feeling, already had this feeling that something was missing, whether it's like, you know, even getting into meaning and stuff like that, there's like some sort of higher energy at work that we just don't understand. But I was like, that's, you know, they, they make fun of uh, kind of the mystical world of things in the psychedelic world and the high, people that talk about higher consciousness, they make fun of them for their discussions of magic and kind of those interesting discussions that I'm always like fun to have. I don't know my feelings about them. I'm kind of just open to everything at this point, but they always make fun of those. And I found that really interesting was like, okay, but you just like assume that through this materialist kind of paradigm that all of a sudden the switch is going to turn on. To me, that was, I was like, that's, that's a pretty magical assumption to make. Like all of a sudden it's just going to turn on. Like, and, and the reason I, I, I make that criticism is because it'd be, it'd be different if we were seeing as they understand the brain, because they are making progress in neuroscience and understanding the brain and all the mechanisms within the brain, but they haven't really answered that question of, or made any progress like at all about that subjective experience that we have of like seeing a red apple, something as simple as that that experience, explaining that. And to me, that big mystery there was like, okay, I got I to seek a different theory. And that's when I started getting to, and, and I'll bring up, um, Philip Goff just came out with a book, um, Galileo's Error, which kind of gets into panpsychism. And I will, I will say he's not, you know, he's not into like the, the psychedelic community and all that, but he's very much just like a philosopher. I think he's even an atheist. But his ideas I found persuasive in the sense that we, we can take and build a bridge almost between kind of this mystical side of things and, and the mystery of consciousness, that side of things, and the materialist side of things. And panpsychism, to oversimplify for, to kind of like start off the conversation, is this idea that we can find consciousness or some level of consciousness in everything. And that's where I kind of found, um, what's the word of it? Co or like cosmo uh, psychism, pretty interesting because it's basically was like, it's, it really connected with me because it, it, it connects with this whole like oneness, one consciousness, one energy of the universe. And then we're all kind of like pulling from that same consciousness where every being has like a certain level of consciousness. So for example, you know, we have a level of consciousness and, and humans like to talk about it in the sense that we have like this superior level of consciousness and everyone. I never like to use that language because, you know, what is superior consciousness? That's assuming a lot of things, right? But then, you know, like a, like a, your dog or your, your, your cat, they have a level of consciousness. A mouse has a level of consciousness. Apes do. And even bugs, for example. And like plants, for example. It all, it goes down this line of different, different forms of consciousness. And a lot of times scientists have a problem with it because they, they look at it through very much the lens of, well, it's not like the human consciousness, but we're, we're assuming that that light switches on again in the sense that, that because something has less than we do, that there's like less there, but really it's like, it's just like different degrees of it, if that makes sense. And and you can always like ask me questions if I'm not coming across super clear. Oh, definitely coming across clear. I was a lot of times when I'm 
listening to somebody talk on the show, I have trouble getting out of my, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to say? What's my next question going to be? <laughs> but I was just like riveted right there. This is my type of conversation for Good deal. sure. Good deal. <laughs> and, you know, I'll just pick up where you left off with talking about other types of uh, animals and their level of consciousness. This is just a, obviously not something provable, but potentially they could even have a level of consciousness that's closer to the unity experience than humans do not further yeah. away. You know, and if you're measuring high and low based on how much of the total universal consciousness that you embody or can experience or know in yourself, then they might be at a higher level of consciousness because I, I say this because recent Finally, since the moratorium of research on psychedelics has been lifted, we've been able to find out things like psilocybin mushrooms actually reduce brain activity, not stimulate yeah. brain activity. So maybe a creature with a less complex brain is more instinctual just because it's aligned with the universal mind and it's playing its part in the big play that this greater consciousness has orchestrated mm -hmm. for, I don't know, I guess its own entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, that, that was the thing was it's like, for example, you, you know, the materials will say we have atoms and electrons and, and cells and various things. And the, the assumption is that they, with consciousness, that consciousness means that they have to be self-aware in the sense that almost we are. Cause like, we can't, we can't understand what they are, what that is experiencing. And just because it's something super simple, well, and I don't even like, it's really hard to even describe what that could be. But the point is, is, is this in the materialist side of things, there's, they're also assuming something in the sense that, oh, you, you compile all these atoms, electrons and, and scientific physical makeups to make a human, for example. But then all of a sudden, uh, it goes back to that switch thing. All of a sudden, something switches on. Why should we assume that something ever switches on? What if it's always on? And that's kind of what I found really persuasive. Um, and I'm not even saying I'm a panpsychist. I'm just, it's, I'm just telling people that this is something I've found persuasive. It's more parsimonious of an explanation, right? I mean, it's yeah. simpler and more efficient and you don't have to assume as much to just go, well, it's a baseline thing. It's always there. And then there you have a nice ground for your philosophy or ground for your, your cosmology, which is yeah. consciousness itself. And we can prove that that ground exists because we experience it. It's like uh, that example of Occam's razor, where basically all things being equal, all uh, within theories, for example, all things being equal, you kind of pick the simplest one that makes the least amount of assumptions in a sense. And so I was like basically laying out, okay, you have the materialist, essentially, you have different forms of panpsychism, and you have the idealist. And I still find things persuasive on the idealist side, but I looked at the materialist, materialist side, and I saw this this big assumption in, you know, all of a sudden the light comes on and we have consciousness. And then on the dealist side where all is mind, I saw an assumption there about basically it's like, how do I explain this part? Um, it's almost like we're, we're experiencing this physical realm, these two separate dimensions, I'll say, these two separate dimensions. And on the dealist side, I almost felt like they were assuming that we're almost always living in that other dimension and then like maybe when the consciousness comes down a little bit, when you're not in that higher state, all of a sudden it's, you're back in almost like this fake reality of projecting everything. And you can, you can tell me I'm wrong on that stuff because I'm not an idealist expert by any means. Well, it depends on which one you're talking about. I mean, there's so many. That's fair. Yeah. And then, and then I saw on the panpsychist side was basically trying to build this bridge and account for these kind of two problems on each side where they both kind of have this kind of woo woo magic switch happen. Right. And the panic psychist, I found kind of like this uniting of the two where it can account for mystical and experience. It can account for our reason based mind and what we discover in science. Cause I find benefits in both sides of those worlds. Cause there's lots of mystery in both sides of those world that I want to be able to explore from a foundation that I feel like, although I'm willing to change it, right? I'm always willing to change whatever foundation I build upon, but it's like, it feels reliable enough to start exploring from that lens and start kind of building off that, if that makes sense. It totally does. And, you know, we might eventually come to realize by some powers of observation that panpsychism isn't 
exactly what some people may describe it as in that, you know, a rock isn't fully conscious, but there could be still some element of consciousness that's your consciousness that is inside of that object. If, you know, material world is a projection of the idea, a projection of mind. Right. So mm -hmm. there's probably some middle ground, though, because it's not like we don't know for certain that if you get a brain injury that you're going to be knocked down a few pegs in awareness. So right. there's it's you know, it's a give and take between both of these philosophies and just probably better not to say that you're an ism or an ist of any kind and yeah. <laughs> keep the mind open. If I have a philosophy, it's that where I, I basically both like politically, philosophically, scientifically, I've stopped trying to put myself under an umbrella term to, for pretty much anything. Cause I just realized I end up, you know, a couple of years later being like, Oh, I was, I was way off about that. And I don't know. I just find that doing it this way keeps me way less dogmatic. And I, although you can't get rid of all of it, I try my best to keep, get rid of most of it. Sure. It's probably better for your potential development to stay undecided about a lot of things. I mean, you do got to make decisions in your life about what you're going to do and how you're going to act and your moral code and all that. But as far as making a big sweeping judgment about this is what everything is and this is what it means. And now I know, well, you've closed yourself off to all the possible other you know, things that it could have been. And if we're looking at the universe as something that's an expression of the infinite, then it, it becomes like the Tao. That which you call the Tao or describes the Tao is not really the Tao. Because by describing yeah, exactly. it, exactly, that's good. Putting it into a division Thanks. category, <laughs> but so one thing I want to maybe pivot to is on this idea of idealism and things being projection projections from the mind. We have a big recent in interest in uh, Gnostic ideas happening throughout the internet, and I wondered what your familiarity w was with Gnosticism and if you know, we could talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls of that, because I'll just throw one of them out there. The idea that everything is fake or this is a prison reality or it's been created by some evil demiurge definitely allows us to continue raping and pillaging nature as if we don't care. <laughs> you know, it makes everything less valuable. Yeah. And, and I'll admit that I'm not super familiar with it. I have like a vague idea of kind of like what you just mentioned, but something I've realized on, I guess, I guess, let me ask you if you could kind of explain it. So it's like almost in the connecting it to the religious sense. Is that, am I right on that? It It is sort of a spinoff or you could even say Christianity was a spinoff of Gnosticism potentially. Yeah. Yeah. There's this idea of, a demiurge, which is like an evil God that created this fake reality and stole the spark of the divine consciousness or the source consciousness and put it into a box. And that's what this is. And that's what we're experiencing. But to me, I, I mean, I just think that's such a defeatist type of uh, philosophy that even if there are maybe some elements of that that are true, it ultimately falls on its face for me because if we are that spark of divine consciousness, that's the infinite, then there's nothing keeping us in the so-called prison except ourselves. So that means that there's not an evil overlord. <laughs> it's just right. Us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I, I guess I did read a while back some of the, the Gnostic gospel just cause I don't know. It played, played a big role and a lot of people don't realize it, it played a big role in the development of various forms of Christianity. Cause yeah, you're right. There, there people created offshoots of, from that. So yeah, I, like, and that's the thing. And, and those ideas in there and this idea that we're in this kind of what it seems like a devilish reality, right? The reason I have a problem with this idea from idealism in general, I guess we can almost like generalize it because Gnosticism has a form of that, but there's ideas and problems I have with idealism in general, in the sense that it creates this almost disconnect from the world. It's almost like, for example, like that example from Gnosticism, it's like an excuse to, I don't know, almost be pessimistic. And then I also find in monotheism uh, in general, in the sense that where they feel like, how do I put this in 
gather my thoughts. They feel like God placed us here, right? And we, as humans, we have this special place here. And, and, and I don't know if Gnostics actually hold this position like today's Christians do. I know there's, they're still related because they're, it's, you know, Gnosticism is like a form of Christianity almost to a sense because they're pulling from the same God, right? And Gnosticism is monotheism, right? Am, am I right on that before? Yeah, I, I think in, in most schools of Gnostic thought, the God that is Yahweh or Jehovah is actually yeah. the bad guy. And they, they do a okay. flip. They, they do a little swap there. There's a whole lot of cosmology with Gnosticism that would take a lot to go into as far as uh, a few different uh, deities and archonic forces yeah. and, you know, these policemen planets that are like our demonic overlords in a sense. And, the, and there's a lot of offshoots and variations of the schools of thought of Gnosticism. But for me, I just kind of use it as an umbrella term for any philosophy that holds that this is a prison planet or a prison experience and that it's something to be transcended or escaped from. And, you know, I totally get what you're saying about the disconnect with idealism too. And I kind of bridge that gap. I mean, I'm probably closest to an idealist of any philosophy. If I had to just identifying with people that have been given that label more than other philosophers, mm -hmm. but I definitely keep the caveat in place that I, as far as for, from my perspective, the world isn't in your head. The world is your head. You're yeah. literally, mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there isn't a disconnect, but that is imp an important, you know, point to make, I think. Yeah. So, and I, and I guess to kind of, so I will kind of make the assumption about, yeah, the prison idea, but also even from that prison idea, I also get the sense that it's like, whatever's here is placed here for us, whether it's, whether it's a demonic prison that we're in or it's a paradise we're in this idea that this something, some being placed this box here for us and we're here to use it. And this is where uh, I, I kind of take issue with some ideas and idealism. And, and like I said, I, I find some ideas and idealism persuasive, but the reason I kind of, kind of dabbled more in the panpsychism side is I found the disconnect particularly with nature in the sense that, all of a sudden, when you look at it, everything is a projection of the mind, everything. And if, and especially with the Gnostic side of things, I'm not saying that all idealists are like this, but like with everything being a projection of the mind, everything becomes usable by us. And it creates this idea that like the, the plants out there, the trees, it becomes a resource for us to just consume because, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's a projection of our mind, right? Yeah, we have dominion over it, as they say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then on the panpsychism side, it's kind of, it's kind of like one of those things where it's it was like this nice, simple idea that accounted for this type of thing, where all of a sudden, no, that's that's not like a projection of me or some separate entity that I can use. No, it is part of me. It is part of the one cosmos that we can't just consume and use because really you're just consuming a part of yourself in some way. So like when I found that really uniting uh, around that idea that kind of answered that problem for me, because, and that, yeah, that's kind of the idea around that. And then I, I want to address your second thought. I forget what your second thought about idealism and the one mind thing, but. That's okay. Well, we can go from here because I'm raring to go. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. One thing you know, to play devil's advocate, so to speak about that this is a construct created for us, or, mm -hmm. or maybe a better way to put it would be by us, potentially. But the uh, symmetry between the sun and moon is crazy good evidence that something is definitely up. I mean, you can see in my logo back there, I have a sun and a moon thing going on. I think mm -hmm. it's it's just wild that I mean, the statistical uh, astronomical odds that there would be a moon that perfectly covers the solar disk for an eclipse multiple times uh, throughout short, you know, like a year mm -hmm. and that it's not too far away or too close to make that covering anything less than exactly perfect. We don't think that they're the same size, of course, but the fact that they're at those proportional distances to look like that is uh, that's too crazy. I mean, you can't, we can't even find something like that on other planets or places that are studied by astronomers. It's, just one little piece of evidence, but 
Uh, back to your point about, you know, the whole consumption culture and the man's dominion over the world that comes about whenever we have this idea that it's ours for some reason or is made for us is I think that we should, as a species, remember that we aren't in nature. Nature isn't out there. We are nature. And like you said, what we consume and destroy is a part of ourself that is being affected. So you know, nature to me is just like the expression of the infinite in all its potentials that it can be played out. Yeah. And I've kind of heard that point before where, and, and I agree to some extent, don't know if it's, it could be, I guess, an argument for idealism. I don't know if that's what you're trying to do, but uh, yeah, it's like, we have all this around us that we we're, we're measuring actually through science, like, wow, the, the chances of all this stuff happening are really slim. This is kind of crazy. But then it's like, oh, it must be just, you know, we're, we're trying to insert meaning into it. And really it's, it's, you know, if we have infinite universes, for example, the multiverse and all this stuff, then really it's not that less probable, blah, blah, blah. I never found that persuasive. Uh, and that's where, again, <laughs> to like bring it back to where I found the cosmo psychism really persuasive because if it is this one consciousness, it kind of, it doesn't necessarily say that it's kind of conscious in the sense that it's making decisions in the, in the way that we do, but it can account for that possibility that yes, there is something constructing it in some way and aligning things up in some way. Because, for example, the way I kind of looked at this, and I don't know if this is the best way to put it, because I haven't really read this anywhere. It's kind of the way I've internalized it myself, is like, okay, one thing I agree with science on is the sense that, hey, we're, we're driven to survive. We make decisions, in a sense, to survive. And whether to spread our offspring, whatever it is, in a sense, it's to survive and allow our offspring to survive, right? So we make decisions in that way. And we do a lot of things that we're not even conscious of or aware of. And to me, like I just went from that level of thinking upward. So if I'm conscious, if I'm assuming or saying that the universe or the cosmos is essentially some level of consciousness as well, it can make decisions in that sense to make life prosper, like our life, like plant life, like animal life, all life to prosper. And things like the aligning of the sun and the moon, I think that that view then accounts for that. Almost like a clue for us to catch on to and realize mm -hmm. that uh, this isn't just the survival game, that there is right. another game in town that you can oh, elevate, yeah. like you said. Yeah. As, yeah. And as far as this whole panpsychism question, I another point I, I kind of like to make is like my personal definition of what spirit is which is the record of all that's happened basically oh yeah or they call it the akashic record in some spiritual circles but you could look at the universal consciousness as literally just like a watcher a watching eye that is observing everything that happens and because that's what consciousness is at its base level is just the being aware being aware that mm -hmm. you're aware is a whole nother thing that's like self-reflexive consciousness and maybe we don't need to ascribe that to everything because we can't prove it as easily. I mean, we seem to have that, but that could be part of why the structure of our brain is the way that it is. There's a sun and moon right. in equal measure in our heads with the left and right brain. Exactly. And, and, and that's why I found the connectedness part of it, where we are kind of connected to our body still in a sense, really interesting because it's like, yeah, maybe the body was made to be able to handle this type of consciousness. And then it all, it all kind of connects in that sense. And I think this is where we can kind of maybe tie it in is, okay, so science is doing a great job of just developing, you know, the laws of physics, these physical properties of the universe. Like, there's no doubt that I respect science. But going back to kind of the mystery side of things, I think there is these these maybe maybe we can call them laws of the universe around consciousness that are undiscovered these these sci these what's the way to say it it's like psycho psycho laws psych, not psychedelic <laughs> but like psychoanalytical or something laws of physics where it's basically accounting for the 
the consciousness side of things that those those properties of and that experience and that subjective experience and that feeling whatever it is it's trying to account for that and it's it's not even saying that they necessarily exist it's just being open to the possibility that they do that they are almost physical in some th- oh, that's what the word is psychophysical laws <laughs> so it's like it's not necessarily the same like idealism isn't true or even like i don't know the philosophical idea around dualism isn't true it's basically saying that there's this possibility that there's these different type of physical laws that we have no idea about. And it's probably really hard for us to discover those because we are actually physically experiencing what that is. So it's hard for us to like take an outward view of that because we are that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's just the same reason that nature is so mysterious because it's infinite and we have infinite potential within ourselves. Mm-hmm. So it's it's why there's this word in philosophy, apotheosis, which is the discovering what something is by ruling out what it isn't. And that's actually the only way that you can measure the circle of the infinite, in a sense, is by mm-hmm. finding all the limiters that are not actually real. But there's a, you know, I think this is actually a good place because you kind of were bringing up psychophysical laws. It's hard to discover consciousness related laws of the universe. Something that I think a lot of people would call natural law or universal law. And uh, you've recently covered a subject on your podcast m- multiple times, which is morality. In philosophy, that's called epistemology, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, morality can dip into all areas of philosophy, even on a metaphysical level too. So yeah, but yeah, yeah. Epistemology usually. I'm about to go there. Oh, perfect. With a a little metaphysical epistemology with a pet theory of my own, which is that freedom is a function of morality, which is to say the more aligned your actions are with the underlying moral law or natural law of the universe, the more freedom that you earn in your daily existence. So the most simple way to define natural law on a moral sense would be basically just one rule, which is don't steal because any kind of harm or fraud that you're inflicting upon another, either stealing their security or their health or their physical stuff or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what you do to others, especially if we've established that, you know, we are nature and the, the world is our head, then you're inviting what you do to others to happen to yourself. So by taking freedom away from others, you take it away from yourself, most likely, especially if you do something really heinous. If you kill somebody, you'll get put in a cage. You know, also that goes for how you treat yourself is another good way of looking at this is that if you're behaving in addictive and self-destructive ways, the end result will also be less freedom because you become enslaved to whatever the thing is. So that's kind of my take on one of the potentially yet to be discovered laws of uh (laughs) consciousness laws of the universe which is that the greater the morality or like the more aligned the morality is with the universe's morality nature's laws then the more free you're going to be or the less consequences you're going to have to your freedom yeah so yeah so how to like kind of address what like kind of my morality is so yeah basically I leave myself open to ideas basically like you just put forward. Cause basically I found myself in agreement with what you put forward and maybe the issue I take with, because I don't, I'm not one that finds myself persuaded by say objective morality in the sense that nature or the universe has these laws that we, no, I don't want to say must follow. But they had like have these laws as part of it that you always ought to follow in that sense. Because and my, my, my reasoning is basically that we kind of have this subjective experience, right? And I find myself to kind of get into the philosophical side of things, Hume's is ought problem really persuasive, where we try to derive meaning and ought from something that we claim to be is. Right. It's like something is part of the universe. There is this law of nature. Therefore, we ought to do this. Right. However, (laughs) there is there is something there is a reasoning behind that that I find that persuasive because I also think it's a beneficial level that it leaves you open 
to various perspectives on morality. Like I can remain open to your perspective on morality. And then the other, the other reasoning is, for example, to kind of like shift the, this discussion slightly, but keeping it on the morality discussion. When we talk about religion, for example, because they're, they're always making proclamations about morality. And they make objective proclamations about morality. They say, this is the truth of the universe. We have to follow this. This is God's law. This is God's word. This is the laws of nature. So this is the side of me that still criticizes organized parts of religion. Because I find religion has a lot of cool ideas, and persuasive ideas, and interesting ideas to listen to. I'm more interested in, sometimes in the Eastern side of things, if we, you know, but, but this idea that there's these laws and then people then take that reality and they want to project that reality on other people. And then sometimes they, when you, when you believe the laws are this intrinsic part of the universe, this truth that is grounded in the universe, I find it sometimes dangerous because all of a sudden they want everyone else to follow that because if they don't follow that, they're not, they're not following the laws of the universe, right? <laughs> And that, and that sounds really scary. And then if you believe in a God on top of that, like this monotheistic God, especially all of a sudden you're going to get, you're going to get shunned. And if we don't get other people to follow this, I'm going to get shunned. And it creates this like downfall effect of all from this really big assumption about these intrinsic parts of morality. So what I kind of do from that reality is, and I see some of those dangerous aspects in that sense, I take the, the ideas around, you know, our, our feelings, essentially. What do we feel? What do we experience? Those are very real to us. The most real thing we have is our experience, right? It's the most, the feelings of emotions, feelings of love, compassion, whatever it is, even anger. Those feelings are very real. And suffering is one that's very real. So like kind of my mindset is, I'm not saying that, you know, it is an intrinsic part of the universe that we should decrease suffering. I'm saying we ought to do that, but I'm not saying it's within the universe. It's like this objective part of it. It's more of like, we need to have a discussion of what we ought to do, but that isn't saying that those oughts, those things that we ought to do for each other, because we've kind of agreed upon them essentially. It's saying that the universe isn't necessarily telling us we have to do that because this is the law. Do you know what I'm saying there? I totally do. I mean, even sort of the theory that I postulated would be murky when you started to apply it to like a lion eating a gazelle. Is that right? You know, yeah. is that going against natural law? Well, wouldn't seem like it because there's a lot of lions that eat a lot of gazelles and they live their full lifespan. But, you know, when it comes to humans, there might be another level of subjectivity to be applied to the question of morality, like you're saying. And I do, I do agree with that. And, I think that uh, at the end of the day, it's more, it's, it seems to me more even like noble if we're going to attribute things to certain moral codes to be more noble than others, perhaps. It's more noble to be in a system where you don't, there is no ought, there's no universal ought, but based on what you see and what you perceive and what you feel and experience, and then you decide your own ought. And right. if that means that you're choosing something that is reducing suffering or helping others or bringing more balance to the world, then that's good for its own sake, I guess, is, is a good. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of philosophers that talk, have talked about that concept that the doing good should be for its own sake and not for any kind of following of a, a rule coming down from on high. I totally agree with you in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And there's. And the reason I'm like, because a lot of people will be like, oh, well, you know, there's no objective morality. Then the kind of the common rebuttal is, is like, oh, well, then murder is OK. And then no, that's, you know, it's like, it's not what I'm saying. It's, if that's what you took from this, then you've got problems. <laughs> yeah, it's like what I take from it is. I, I we can it, it allows you to be more open to various moralities, like I said, it or it allows you to not have less of a chance of being dogmatic, more compatible to people. And there are various, maybe, maybe they have traditions that were like, oh, that's, that's different. You know, our culture doesn't do that tradition. 
instead of saying, no, that's, that's wrong. We can, we can kind of more easily adapt to various perspectives throughout the world. And that's why I found it persuasive. But then also I realize is, and maybe this is something that is driven by some higher being, some higher energy in the universe. We have these feelings. We have these feelings of empathy. We have these feelings of suffering. We have all these feelings and emotions that we experience, very real experiences. Like I said before, probably the most real thing about being human is those experiences. To me, those states are kind of our starting state, right? Like when we're born, we're kind of, we start in a state of, we're, we're not going to be an asshole to people, right? We, we're not, we want to work with people. We don't want to people to suffer. We start in that state. It's when we, we insert things throughout life. We insert stories, we insert narratives, we insert dogmatic viewpoints that all of a sudden people start acting outside of that state. They start inserting suffering into people. They start doing things that cause that. And what that tells me is that when we leave the door open to discuss various moralities, various traditions, various values, various meanings, purposes, all that stuff, that very large discussion that we're going to be having for the thousands of years after us, forever long, we're on this planet, right? What that tells me is, is that that's why we should remain open so that we don't allow those stories to consume everyone, essentially. (laughs) Because we have, you know, and, and the way I look at it too, is we kind of have this history of certain stories consuming people in a sense that it causes a lot of suffering. And the common example, I, and I don't even like using this example as much because it's overused, but like the Crusades, for example, they were fighting for some sort of belief in some higher power morality that they held, and they thought they were justified in killing people because of it. And, and that's not even saying, like, let's say the whole world decided to accept subjective morality, right? I'm not saying that all of a sudden everything's going to be like peaceful and we're going to live in bliss and we're going to live in harmony and all that stuff. There's a lot of other factors that we got to work on there. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a starting point in the sense that, hey, if we work on this, we're going to decrease some sort of human suffering if we accept that we insert a lot of strong beliefs into the discussion of morality. I love, I love it, man. (laughs) It definitely brought to mind this whole concept too, of like the dogmas being what create the dilemmas and that our default state is definitely more open and less defined, which is admirably what you seek to do for yourself in your own mind state. So pretty awesome. Reminds me of uh, one of my favorite quotes is Soren Kierkegaard, the crowd is untruth. And it brings to mind a very classic individ- individual versus the collective conversation that's a big part of many different philosophies. And I think it's one of the most important because it's like a clear component of the hero's journey. If we're talking about narratives, that the hero is the outsider, that you do have to go your own way. And another, just to drop more great quotes uh, from philosophers. Krishnamurti says this type of thing all the time. Truth is a pathless land. And he often made statements like that. It, ironically, people followed him as a guru. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually one of the reasons I really like him is because he makes it very much a point to that remaining openness thing, kind of living life with this try, at least trying because like, like I said, I'm very much one that understands that you can't get rid of all the dogmatism. It's like, it's like you try to live life with this blank canvas, this open prairie, right? You kind of try to cut the trees and bushes all down, right? But there's always going to be a couple trees and bushes left. But you try to keep as many of them clear as possible so you're open to some various things growing, right? Kind of that idea. And, and yeah, he always, he's a great speaker and I always, I always find him interesting too, because he's basically like, people shouldn't be listening to me, but you know, I'm not going to give you the truth, but <laughs> people keep listening to me. <laughs> so yeah, he's very humble. He did, he did his best. He was, he's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that whole thing of like trying to chop down every little 
tree and pull every weed till you have a clear field uh, of understanding the ground of reality. It's right back to the problem that materialist science has with trying to find the canvas of reality. It's just, mm-hmm. it's not there. I mean, it's subjective all the way down. And uh, as we were saying, Krishnamurti's real positive point to to his uh, legacy is that he specifically advised against following any person or an ism and would specifically say that's the death of truth, which I think is a really relevant thing to look at in 2020 because it, postmodern style identity politics are creating dogmas and divisions faster than ever. If you ask me, it's like we used to have just a couple of factions that were fighting with each other. Now there's everything you can imagine <laughs> every little, I, every, every identity that you could uh, want has now become a faction in a sense. And it's like we, everybody versus everybody. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you kind of made me realize with that quote that you kind of made me remember about uh, Krishna is in this sense of, yeah, not following gurus and not following basically like not following dogmatically following people. Because I found myself, you know, when I was more in my political days, I guess you could say, following various talking heads and just, you know, I found myself regurgitating their ideas, regurgitating their talking points, all this stuff. And and then I like kind of started translating that into, wait, I'm just regurgitating this, this school of thought, this political school of thought and acting like that's some like guru I'm supposed to follow. And he like, he really made me realize even within the past, I would say even a couple years. And yeah, just like the dogmatism that you don't even realize you're, you're allowing to latch on you like a leech. And you don't even, it's like, it's like, yeah, like a leech where you're not even really aware. Sometimes like a leech is on you. You have to go and like look around and, and find them and then take them off. Right. But like, if you, if you never go and look, all of a sudden the leech is just going to be there for a while. It's going to keep sucking you away with, with its dogmatism. And yeah, you just kind of made me realize that. And I will say, I, I, I agree with you on the issues, these various identities and these groups, and they're all like kind of fighting each other and hating each other. And it's just, it's like a cesspool right now. And I will say postmodernism gets a bad rap because it gets thrown in there because I do find some ideas in postmodernism interesting because I find postmodernism to actually be an idea. In many ways, it fits with the ideas. And I, and I will say I'm not like an expert on Eastern philosophy because it is like a new thing since I've graduated from college. But I found it uniting with some kind of Eastern thoughts of kind of postmodernism, this idea that, hey, we're all creating narratives. We're all creating these stories. These stories are made up. So remain basically this, I took it to reduce it down to this idea that, hey, it, it forces you to also remain open. It's like this Western way of making you aware of the stories and the identities and the groups that we dogmatically follow. And the reason that postmodernism does often get a bad reputation is because there's not really this like, there's not really this clear leader of it. There's influences to postmodernism, but there isn't really like that, that person to go to like, hey, what, what is postmodernism? We don't really have that guy. Uh, we have like Foucault and a lot of times existentialists get thrown in there like Camus and Simone de Beauvoir. Um, you know, they get thrown in there and, and Sartre, for example, and Nietzsche, for example, but really they're not postmodernists. So I will say that is like, they kind of get this bad rap because unfortunately, as we criticize leaders, they don't have a leader, you know? Well, I think there's just a huge variety of ways to call something postmodern. And when Mm -hmm. a big part of it seems, at least when I was in school and getting exposed to things that were labeled as postmodern, it did seem to have a lot to do with power and group dynamics and Kind of just, I mean, as a, as just a philosophy and an examination, it's kind of harmless, I guess. But there there may be some ground to link it to modern identity politics because there are postmodern thinkers that would have definitely sort of advocated for y- your group who your group is 
what you should sort of associate with and other groups are just trying to steal your power, that type of idea. But, you know, like trying to give blanket statement generalizations about entire generations of thinkers is never really, it's just as silly as trying to make one person in the face of, right. of a, an entire school of thought. Yeah. And yeah, you're exactly right. And, but that's kind of the reason I find postmodernism interesting is it does deal with those power structures. And there is a lot of people participating in identity politics today, for example, and identity of various things very dangerously too. I hate to be like that guy be like, well, they, they interpreted it wrong. Right. <laughs> but they, it's like kind of bringing it back to first the power structures and I'll kind of connect to that point, but like the power structures that's what postmodernism was criticizing. It was like, it's kind of like Nietzsche's point, like beware your idols, beware who you're following in the sense that postmodernism saw these power structures. It saw, for example, the government is this central power structure that can become dangerous. Corporations are this dangerous power structure that can become dangerous. Groups in society, various groupings of people, whether it's by ethnicity or, or just basically shared ideals and ideas, those power structures can become dangerous. And to me, it was commenting on this idea that beware of those power structures and how people are joining teams and holding up that flag and being like, this is my team, we're going to win, and that idea, and then trying to consume that power and then dogmatically follow it. And then that's where I would say, like today's people that definitely identify with the postmodernism or identify with the thinkers that have influenced postmodernism they are doing that. They're saying, they're, it's almost like they're making you aware of the dangerous power structures that have popped up in society. But then they're like, oh, but we're going to form ours and ours is just going to be better. But really, they're just doing the same thing. They're dogmatically creating a power structure that is going to become dangerous if they don't watch themselves. And that's why I found kind of, I do like some of the ideas in postmodernism. But I like, a, I like some of the ideas in a lot of schools, so... <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and it's always going to be true that weaker minds will misconstrue the ideas of great minds to justify bad behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Postmodern thinkers often do criticize all these different power structures, but usually it doesn't return it back on itself and criticize itself. To me, that's why I've always had kind of an association with Marxism and communism to postmodernism, because it's a similar thing. It's like, you know, we got to destroy the elites and uh, take the power back, but then we're just going to build an, a new type of uh, dictatorship out of it. So <laughs> the classic revolution becoming the repression and that cyclical thing where the new guard becomes just as sort of corrupt as the old guard. And which is why in a positive point to postmodernism, the decentralization of it as a school of thought is hopefully reflective of a future for humanity where we don't take our cues from centralized authorities. Yeah. And, and I have to say, cause that's something. So postmodernism also had a big influence on me realizing something about myself in the sense that I realize, especially in politics, this happens is it, there's a lot, probably more than almost any other base of knowledge and thinking and ideas and groupings, politics is this pool of dogmatism and this like team aspect and this power structure aspect. Cause it did, it, it like made me realize that, Hey, I'm being dogmatic in my views politically. And it did kind of force me. And then I used kind of other schools of thought to help me take me down this road, but like remain open to various things. Like I can see more positives in various ideas. And, and like, for one example, like communism, for example, I never was persuaded by the ideas of communism. And, I, and I'm still not really like persuaded because I see a dangerous power structure there and stuff like that. But I'm persuaded by their various critiques that they have. And Marxism, for example, is various critiques. But I'm also persuaded by some ideas in capitalism. And, and I think they, it can have positive effects. And then there's also a discussion to be had. Maybe we have this new idea and this new idea around economics that we can create. Like, why are we assuming that capitalism is like the end state, right? So it's like, I started realizing I can kind of pick and choose. Like, they all kind of critique. They all have good critiques almost, I find. So it's like, okay, how do we take those critiques and create something? I don't have the answers. I'm not smart enough for that. <laughs> but but I, that's like something I realized is like, I'm trying to 
evaluate the critiques they have of each other. And it kind of starts letting me maybe be open to when something does pop up that we can fully embrace. Yeah. The critiques of capitalism are pretty valid. Interestingly, capitalism as a term was created by Marx. So what we now describe the status quo as actually came from the description of the critics. So that's how you know it's very far reaching the impact that some of these schools of thought have had on us and people don't even necessarily realize it. That's a great way to end <laughs> this amazing podcast. It's been fantastic, man. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, we we went all over the place. It all linked together nicely. We have a lot of nice jiving of our ideas. All around this was a super fun time. I uh, yeah, I'm really fun. glad you reached out and got in touch to do this and uh make sure you give everybody your you know, website and where they can find you. And if there's anything, any way you want them to uh, connect with you on social media or what have you, or, you know, any threads on this conversational sweater that you want to finish p putting together, weaving together. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you uh, allowed me to come on as well. And I was definitely happy to do the show. Um, but yeah, yeah, I guess to, to drop my stuff, uh, yeah, if you just like search the philosophy guy in your podcast player, I think I'm my website's like the philosophy guy dot fireside dot fm. It's my it's my podcast host. Um, but yeah, you can Twitter is a good way to get in contact with me as well. It's probably my most active social media. I have a Discord for my podcast. Uh, my Twitter is just if you like, I think it's Brendan Weber underscore. Um, what other stuff should I drop? My YouTube is less popular than my podcast, but I like occasionally post stuff there. <laughs> um, I try to get better at that. It's just, it's a lot more work. So it's like one of those things that gets put on the back burner first. Um, Plus YouTube yeah. algorithms really hate people that are open-minded and centered in their perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've had a hard time like tapping into that. So it's like something I'm trying to get better at, but podcasting is just way more simple and more laid back for me. But anyway, yeah, that's my stuff. And the YouTube's the philosophy guy too. Basically, if you search the philosophy guy in Google, I've made it a point so that most of the stuff comes up. So you can find me that way. <laughs> you heard the guy, go give him a follow, leave him a review on the iTunes app. That's always a really good way to help out oh, a podcaster. Yeah, super helpful. Yeah. You like what they do. And I'm sure you'll love Brendan's show if you enjoyed this conversation because it felt like just a big, long one of your conversations from what I can gather. <laughs> awesome yeah, stuff. No, yeah, yeah. And I, and I really enjoyed it because it was a discussion. Basically, it's like we had different viewpoints on maybe a couple things. I feel, I feel like we agreed a lot, but um, we just like discussed those things instead of uh, basically debating those things, which is something I find important because I, <laughs> I, a little side note, I did the whole like debates on YouTube thing. And I got frustrated really quickly because what I hate in any conversation is when people disagree, they just start, they just start like turning into robots and they just start saying their little talking points back and forth to each other. It's like, they don't internalize it. They don't really actually address it. It's just like, Oh, I heard that point. What's, what's the talking point I can say now that addresses that point. And they just like keep regurgitating back and forth. I'm like, nothing is happening. <laughs> like, <laughs> no one's changing their mind. No one's finding agreement. It's just like a cesspool of regurgitation of some argument they heard somewhere. Anyway, that's my side tangent about YouTube debates. Yeah, that's a good tangent. Regurgitate <laughs> sparingly. <laughs> no, yeah. we all we all do it. We all resynthesize, repackage, and repolish ideas that we find oh, applicable. Yeah. But it is important to not let that become our, our dogma. I think that was definitely like the overarching theme of this whole conversation and also i want to drop uh, mindutah.org so you can check and it's it's starting to start off in utah um but it's also going to be probably an educational resource and also people can right now it's in the beginning stages but you can drop your email and all that good stuff thanks for being here brendan this was like i said a total blast and i know the audience loved it so we'll have to do it again and oh, stay yeah. stay safe out there for sure you as well all right. Thanks, man.
the hand grenades, Batman. That was a mind blowing episode. I couldn't have loved it more. Thank you so much, Brendan, for hitting me up to do a chat and introducing me to your podcast, which is now on my list of things to check out when something new happens. And thanks to all you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It was a great gateway conversation into a lot of interesting topics like idealism and epistemology and pretty much any of the philosophers that got brought up like Krishnamurti in this episode would be really worth your time to go into and explore for yourself. I'm sure Brendan would agree. That's what put him on the path he's on is his interest in these topics. And they're really applicable to all areas of life because philosophy is about the love of wisdom and wisdom is application of knowledge in an efficient, synergistic and positive way. So the first hour being amazing as it was, I got to tell you some about the second hour, of course, as is customary. If you're not a Plus member yet, you can sign up at interversepodcast.com by clicking on the link to Plus or checking out the show notes for this episode for the link or just go straight to patreon.com forward slash interverse where you can subscribe for five bucks a month and get three to five double length episodes each month. And the second hour is always really better because it's an expansion on the first hour. You got to warm up some of these ideas before you can get into the deep end as a friend and a past guest of the show once said the first hour is usually the 3D type of exploration and the second hour is where we go 5D, transcendental. <laughs> I hope that's true, or at least it feels like a transcendental conversation. To me, it did. We talked about a lot of really fun stuff in the beginning of the plus extension. We got into the watchers or the Nephilim and ideological egregores, which would be non-physical but independent consciousness forms that influence society created by collective thought patterns. We got into mystical encounters with other intelligences and the variety of psychological tools used to explain the other or the subconscious. Or like I said, there's a lot of different terms and ways of looking at it. And we talked about a few of them. We discussed and explored the magical nature of the flow state as psychonauts, artists, and athletes experience it got into why the body isn't a prison and the ego shouldn't be permanently killed, microdosing tech professionals and the importance of research on plant medicines, creativity as a gateway to your higher calling or unique spiritual pathway. Brendan talked about his involvement with Mind Utah, a new organization promoting consciousness and psychedelic medicinal research. We analyzed destiny, morality, and neutrality with the story of the new show, The Witcher. And we got into the Gnostic nuggets of Rick and Morty and finding the meaning in the nihilism. So not that often that we get to talk about Rick and Morty or a lot of pop culture stuff on the show. Even if you aren't familiar with The Witcher or Rick and Morty, it's still an engaging and rousing part of the conversation because we really get into the whole determinism versus free will thing pretty hard in both of those sections. And that's always a conversation worth having. It's an interesting thing the destiny question and whether we created ourselves or it's forced on us or as we kind of come to conclusion wise that it's somewhere sort of in the middle. But one of the big themes of the show overall was panpsychism. And I love that concept. Even if I wouldn't say I'm a panpsychist or I'm an ist or an ism of any kind, there is a lot of new science that demonstrates a unified field theory and that there is consciousness in this energy field or quantum soup background of reality. And one story that I have told before, but I'll summarize real quick, again, just a personal story that was one of my first experiences that led me to really consider this panpsychism thing for real was at a music festival a long time ago, probably like five years ago at this point, maybe no, like six years ago, I had just gotten my first fun crystal wand. And I was using it a lot, exploring energy healing and stuff like that. And I had been using it for about a year and I decided I wanted to pass it on to somebody at this festival. There's like tens of thousands of people at this event. So it was really big. The person I ended up giving it to, (laughs) well, I guess I'll tell the whole story. This dude, I handed him the crystal and he immediately laid down and took off his clothes and put it on his chest in the middle of a stage of people. And I was like, oh my God, you must really like this thing but put your pants back on before you get in trouble, please. And I gave it to him. He had this, a really wicked, awesome Alex Gray full back tattoo. So it was kind of recognizable. 
And a few hours later, I ran into another acquaintance who told me this story about meeting a guy who reminded her of me for some reason and that he gave her a crystal that had broken off of one that he was carrying while they were talking. And then she hands me this little shard. And I was like, did the guy who gave, gave you this have a full Alex Gray back tattoo? And she's like, how did you know that? So uh, there, there's a long story there. But what happened was a thing that supposedly does not have any agency or will to act in the world was able to find its way back to me in part, at least after insurmountable odds really against that very thing happening. So there's a lot of questions about how this would have happened. Is it that the crystal itself was somehow conscious and had the ability to influence the thoughts and the actions of the people holding it? Or maybe it's more like this egregore idea or a collective thought form that's been attached to this item because more than one person has had the experience of some kind of meaning being attached to it. I don't really know, but the egregore question is really interesting. I've been exploring that a lot in a variety of avenues. And there was a really cool YouTube video I want to tell you about that I saw recently with a YouTuber called Gigi Young. You can find her by that name. And she just did a video about artificial intelligence and this concept around it of summoning the demon. And that's a lot to, to talk about and a lot to take in. But when we get to the idea of creating an artificial consciousness, what does that really mean? And especially in terms of this unified field theory or the fact that there's panpsychism or that there's consciousness in everything. So I have a personal kind of take on what might be going on with AI and why it can be linked to or akin to summoning a demon, which is that energy and consciousness are really the same thing. Like, your body and brain health dictates your level of consciousness, intelligence, awareness, energy, all of that. So if you have bad energy in your system or low energy, you're not going to be very aware or even able to pay attention to stuff very well. That's just like a little bit of evidence that energy is consciousness, but energy like water does take the form of its container. That's why your body's health does have an impact on your consciousness. And there's this thing that's like what you would call the divine spark or a tether that hooks your biological container to this unified field of source consciousness or background universal energy. So artificial containers, though, they're disconnected from organic life. They're not connected to that field in the same way, potentially. And that disconnect means that maybe they need to vampirize energy to survive like parasites. That could be what we're dealing with when we look at so-called demons or negative egregores, artificially created constructs of consciousness that are separate from the greater field or not organically tethered to that field. So whether the thought form is completely etherical or there's some sort of really complex computer system and circuitry mimicking the complexity of a human brain that then energy is juiced into. That could be the structure of a so-called demon. I mean, you're looking at something that doesn't have its own tether to universal source energy, needs to then find energy, feed on energy. In the case of a computer, you're putting electricity right through it. So it is feeding on something in that sense. And we don't need to like call the demon in this instance necessarily evil. Because like I said, it takes the shape of its container. Maybe these things can be useful. I mean, we do use some pretty complicated technology all the time. But there is this weird pull from the technology. Like, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I am on computers all the time. And I use my phone quite a bit. And you all probably have been familiar with the feeling of like, oh, I just need to pull out my phone and check on nothing because I have five seconds at a red light <laughs> or whatever. So our attention is a form of energy as well. The technology could be in a way feeding on our attention. And I've seen some interesting research into poltergeist activity as well, that a strange point that has been noticed by some researchers is that places where there's heavy duty poltergeist or spirit haunting activity, there is a higher use of electricity, like their electric bill goes up. And then when they turn things around, usually 
involving getting a perspective shift or an attitude improvement and being more loving and positive and creating an environment where there's not this lower form of energy for whatever these <laughs> vampiric poltergeist forms are. They can't feed on the positive energy, maybe that it seems to be in the research. So anyway, hopefully that wasn't too weird of a ramble, but I would recommend checking out Gigi Young's video about AI. If you are interested in what I'm talking about, she goes into all kinds of things that I didn't just mention. I was just kind of giving my own take on it because in the plus extension, although I brought up the idea of the ideological egregores and how they influence society in movements that masses of people take together, we didn't really explore the idea in depth at all. And it would be hard to actually do that. So I wanted to give a few more of my thoughts on it. And uh, yeah, I hope you appreciate Brendan coming on the show as much as I did and would maybe even consider going and following him, subscribing to his podcast, The Philosophy Guy. You can find that in the show notes. And of course, the mindutah.org website. If you want to get involved in his organization, maybe you're local. That would be pretty awesome. And other than that, I just hope that you guys are surviving out there. It's been a... <laughs> hectic January. If you're paying attention to the news too much, it makes it seem like things are pretty rough and bad. Weird stuff always happens though. So don't worry about it too much and keep that positive grind going, following that creativity as your gateway to your higher calling or unique spiritual pathway. I am doing that myself with this podcast and a few other pursuits. But if you're not subscribed to Plus, you are missing out on what I really love about the show, which is the deeper end of the conversations. And it's not too much of a ask to get $5 from you a month to subscribe to this thing. I mean, I'm already giving you an hour for free, which is a decent amount of work. I won't cry about it because I enjoy doing the work. But if you want me to be extremely consistent and able to deliver weekly episodes like I try to do, I do my best to do. I got four out in January. Uh, this one's coming out on the last day of January, but still counts. If you want me to be able to do that, you really ought to consider giving some financial support and you do get something back. I think it's a fairly fair form of reciprocity, but enough about that. I'm not trying to beg. I'm just glad that you guys are here and looking to expand your perspective on yourself and the possibilities in your world. And that's what we're all about <laughs> with Interverse. So thanks for being here. I'm going to play us out with a new live performance from Acid Cats, which is the combination of Lucid and Flintwick, two musical artists who have been on the show in the past, both awesome guys, friends of mine who have now formed a super duo where they do their live looping electronic music slash analog instrument thing. And it's really cool and psychedelic and fun. So go find them on soundcloud.com slash acid cats. K uh, instead of a C and a Z instead of an S. Acid K-A-T-Z. But yeah, thanks for being here with us. It's been fun. And I've got great stuff coming up next month. Some really interesting interviews on the calendar. Can't wait to get to them and get them to you. So be good. Much love. Bye-bye. <laughs>